Like millions of others, I found the Kathy Newman and Jordan Peterson interview, which was published by Channel 4 on the 16th of January 2018, to be absolutely fascinating. It was so interesting and multifaceted, actually, that I've now watched it four times in full. I've also read a lot of the mainstream and independent media coverage of the interview, but found that the vast majority of assessment simply delves into the verbal content, the intellectual ideas and the possible motives behind those verbal exchanges. That element of the interview is monumentally important, of course, because it exemplifies certain ideological and intellectual constraints that are now dividing Western society and how we can deal with them. Supposed concerns about emotional offence-taking as a cover for suppression of free speech and open debate, the deliberate distortion of an opponent's arguments to character assassinate them, and so on. These things were certainly at work in the interview, but you probably are already familiar with those arguments. So, I want to offer in this video what I hope will be an important contribution to public discourse about this interview by bringing attention to the very subtle but also very powerful non-verbal communication. By this I don't just mean facial expressions, hand gestures and posture, I also mean the physical arrangements of the interview and even the use of camera work. That's right, the camera work, it plays a very important and at one point revealing role in the discussion. Let's get started with the basic physical setup. Interviewer and interviewee sat directly facing each other in opposition on either side of the screen. A lot of more casual TV debates that don't involve an intended ideological clash will have the two parties sat at slight angles to each other because when people are in agreement, or at least they like each other's company, they have a habit of slightly turning so that they're both facing more or less the shared direction. Like when people are stood at a bar together, the table arrangement here is a curious one as well. The unusual shape and angle means that both of them can only cross their legs away from the camera and are thus unable to turn and adopt a more friendly angle to each other. I'm pretty sure if the table wasn't there then Peterson would turn a bit to visually accommodate the camera audience and thus appear a more open person. The table doesn't allow this. I've looked back through lots of Channel 4 interview setups and found that many of them used to have round tables for casual interviews. There's also a second table on Jordan's side on the left. That gives a bit of an impression of him being blocked off, so to speak. Maybe the interview was part of a longer news report that involved Kathy interviewing two guests at one point, with both of them sat over there on the left, part of the same broadcast. I don't know if that's the case or not. In fact, that's the only explanation I can think of for that, other than it being there to portray Peterson as being sort of behind a barrier. Oh, by the way, the use of jagged tables by Channel 4 probably is a subliminal link to their logo as well, which is broken into jagged angular chunks. Alright, so the blue and purple backgrounds and the red and black chairs, as far as I know, that's the usual colour combination with Channel 4 interviews today. Fairly bright, stimulating colours, but no specific relationship to this interview. Then there's the weird top-down image of kids or teenagers at desks in a classroom. This is there all the way through the interview, and it only makes sense towards the end, so we'll come back to that later. Kathy has a list with her, as is usually the case with presenters in uh, TV chat debates. Presumably it's a list of bullet points and some quotes. Things she wants to discuss, or has been told by her programme director she should discuss. That's more likely the case. It's not just one piece of paper, though. It appears to be a batch of them, which gives the impression that she has a lot of information. This I find funny because as far as I can tell, she never at any point reads any of the other pages. I'd love to see that front piece of paper though, as I suspect it would shed a lot of light on her motives and those of her superiors. One thing that guests never seem to do in these ideological TV debates is to bring their own pen and paper with them so that they can take down notes during the interview to aid their own assessment of the interviewer's lines of questioning. That could be pretty good in a situation like this, but fortunately Jordan Peterson seems to have a bit pretty good on-the-fly memory, so he's able to refer back to earlier points of the conversation with accuracy. And that helps him a lot during this interview. Kathy also doesn't have a copy of Peterson's book on the desk, even though the interview is partially about his book, and as far as I know, he's on tour promoting that book in Britain at the moment. Or at least he was when he was doing this interview. Maybe it's because the aim of the interview is to trash him and his book rather than promote it. Or am I reading too much into it? Okay, aside from the batch of papers in which only the first page is referred to by Cathy, she also has a big fat black pen constantly in her hand, but which she never uses, or at least not for writing. Why not just leave the pen on the desk? 
Instead, she subtly uses the pen from time to time in a sort of pen is a substitute for the sword series of pointing gestures, mildly poking the pen in Jordan's direction. If she wasn't holding the pen and instead pointed at him with her finger, then her non-verbal hostility would be a lot more obvious. In Cathy's defence though, I'll add that I've seen other interviews she's done and the batch of papers and holding of a pen seems to be a standard for her, even if she's not in combat mode. It generally gives off an air of this woman is a professional who's taking note of everything her interviewee says, even though she never writes down what they say. Bit of an interviewer's gimmick, but in the case of a combative interview, I think, whether intended or not, it adds to the sense of attack. Not only am I grilling you in front of an audience, a large audience, but this is on record. Everything you say is effectively being written down. Alright, so that's the basic physical setup. Then there is the issue of camera work. Now the main conversation is a standard couple of zoom shots from cameras placed toward the very edge of the set. But there's also a crane mounted camera or two hovering about. Occasionally we cut to one of them high above and floating about like a hawk. But there are two points where this hovering camera moves in toward Peterson. The first is about a minute and 20 seconds into the debate. We see a close side on profile of Peterson that pulls out. And the second is about 6 minutes and 25 seconds in, where the camera swoops right down and over the table, getting in Peterson's face almost. This isn't a zoom shot, it's the physical movement of the camera into the debate space. We can tell by the angles of the lower edge of the table on the right and how they change. This is the only point in the whole interview where the camera moves down and prominently into Jordan's field of vision, potentially distracting him from the interview itself. So let's consider the context of these two close-up crane shots. The first one is outside of Jordan's field of view, just about, and it occurs as Cathy is launching into her first major ideological attack on Jordan by ridiculously inferring that he's some sort of bigot because his work mainly appeals to men. But it's not, I wasn't specifically aiming this message at young men to begin with. It just kind of turned out that way. And it's mostly, you admit, it's mostly men listening. I mean, 90% of your audiences are men, Well, it's right? about 80% on, in, on YouTube, which is a, YouTube is a male domain primarily. So it's hard to tell how much of it is because YouTube is male and how, how much of it is because of what I'm saying. The camera didn't start at that position, by the way. At the very beginning of the interview, a brief cut showed a high angle, distant view, non-intrusive. So in that first minute and a half, the crane camera has gone from up here to almost whispering in Jordan's ear. Though it hasn't yet moved directly into his view of Cathy, its movement will have been subconsciously picked up on by Jordan because peripheral vision is very good at detecting movement. So as Jordan is under his first personal attack and shows his first sign of feeling a little bit flustered, the camera editor or director opts to cut straight to the crane shot, but it's in the wrong place. So it arcs around to get a more frontal view of Jordan and makes its own presence more visible to Jordan himself. But this wasn't needed. The stationary zoom shot would have been sufficient. So was the intention here to use the crane camera to physically invade Jordan's field of view and make him feel more uncomfortable at the point where he was under his first semantic attack? Well, let's examine the second shot and see if there's a pattern there. This time Cathy is on his case accusing him of disregarding women's desire to have top job positions and of being unconcerned about a supposedly sexist gender pay gap. But you're saying basically it doesn't matter if women aren't getting to the top because that's what's skewing that gender pay gap, isn't it? You're saying, well, that's just a fact of not life. Saying women it aren't necessarily matter. going to get to the top. No, I'm not saying it doesn't matter either. You're saying, I'm saying there are multiple life. reasons for it. Yeah, but those reasons, why, why should women put up with those reasons? Why should, Why should women, women be put content up with it? I'm not, not saying to that they the should top. put up with it. I'm saying that the claim that the wage gap between men and women is only due to sex is wrong. He's starting to look a little flustered again and is clearly on the defence. And so the crane camera quickly swoops down like a hawk across the table and into his face and just sits there for a short while. This must have been very unsettling for Jordan, but he keeps his cool and gradually wrestles the argument back. But you can tell he does get a little bit nervous here. He makes fidgety gestures with his thumbs as the camera swoops in, probably an expression of nervousness. 
Now, I very strongly suspect that this camera swoop was planned in advance of the interview. The timing is so specific in relation to the conversation. It is done at the moment where Jordan looks like he's crumbling under semantic accusational pressure like the programme director is trying to further unsettle his subject by emphasising to Jordan that he's being watched and recorded for millions of people to see. It's very sneaky, and I think it further suggests that the relentless attack on Jordan's character isn't just from Cathy Newman personally, it's been arranged by her superiors who, for whatever their reasons, have taken it upon themselves to invite Jordan for a supposed interview that turns out to be nothing more than a propaganda smear attack piece. I mean, think about the idiocy of many of the things Cathy says to Jordan, desperately trying to twist his words to sound like some sort of insensitive male chauvinist. She's not a stupid woman. She's been a Channel 4 presenter for years, and I've seen her on TV hundreds of times. She's good at her job. But in this case, it appears that she's been told her job is to demolish her guest by any means necessary, and has probably been supplied with a series of attack points which she has written down in front of her. Big shame on Cathy Newman for going along with it, of course, but I don't believe for a minute that this was just a battle between her and Jordan Peterson. It was a battle between Jordan and Cathy's superiors at Channel 4, with her as the hired attack dog. And those superiors deservedly lost big time, and they should be named, rather than all of the blame just going in Cathy Newman's direction. So yes, I'm actually speaking in both Cathy and Jordan's defence. I think if these two were just chatting about these issues without her strings being pulled by an agenda set by her bosses, then the interaction would be much friendlier. A lot has been made of the aggressive tone and manner of Cathy, but actually I don't think she's too bad in that respect. She's not much worse than she typically is in other interviews she's done, and she doesn't normally receive such bad press for it. It's mainly the words that she uses which convey hostility to Peterson. reciprocal virtually by definition so let me put a quote to you from the book where you say there are whole disciplines in universities forthrightly hostile towards men so let me put a quote to you from the book where you say there are whole disciplines in universities but in terms of body language and voice he maintains a slouched and relaxed posture and soft voice tone through most of the interview and i think this makes kathy seem more aggressive than she actually is In fact, I think Jordan knew that his composure would have that effect, and it makes it harder for Cathy to be much more combative non-verbally. On the other hand, his passive composure perhaps gave her the impression at the start of the interview that he was going to be a pushover verbally, so I think she took a false sense of security from this. It's actually a very powerful technique from Jordan. If you keep your own non-verbal combative side hidden from an opponent, then it can have the effect of making them either afraid to become aggressive because they have no idea what your hidden aggressive side is going to be like, or when you do eventually show your combative side when there's an important issue at stake and a fight that needs to be won, your overconfident opponent can be shocked by your sudden display of strength and confidence and they'll back off. This works very well with handling bullies, by the way, both managerial and social bullies. I highly recommend it. In contrast to his slouched, almost sheepish posture, Gordon conveys confidence with prolonged eye contact, and when required he has the squinting glare to let his opponent know that he has his own little predatory side. Cathy is hardly afraid of eye contact herself, but she has to break away from time to time to view her list. It also seems to me that despite her effort to appear emotionally made of steel or to appear hostile, I think she actually quite likes Peterson and feels comfortable with him. In fact, at several points, Cathy's act is broken down by Jordan's humour and sharp logic, and in those moments she gives lovely warm smiles and even laughs along with him. But then she realises she's not doing her job of attacking him relentlessly, and so she quickly adopts the attack mode act again. It's such a shame. I'd love to see these two discuss these issues in a freer context. I think the very end of the interview is the giveaway. She gives him a genuine smile and he smiles back. I'm going to put that up against the rather vague accusations that my followers are making the lives of people that I've targeted miserable. Jordan Peterson, thank you. (laughs) My pleasure. Nice talking with you. 
When people have a serious altercation and this heartfelt hostility, they don't tend to say goodbye with nice smiles in this way. They might use a fake smile in which the eyes don't squint much, but that's not the case here. Kathy looks like she's about to burst into laughter. This is true in therapy and counselling generally. When a person has made worthwhile progress in a therapy session, they tend to leave the session with a smile on their face. And if they're laughing about the problem that they were so miserable about when they walked in, that's a really good sign of progress too. Incredibly good sign. So I think that aside from the parameters set by her bosses, Kathy and Jordan, on a base personal level, bonded fairly well in this interview. Sometimes a fight can do that to people. There's elements of the laughter and smile thing throughout the debate, actually. After Jordan semantically fends off the first few attacks, he starts smirking and giggling at the stupidity of some of the questions, statements and allegations being thrown at him. He already knows he's won the debate, he won it very early on within the first 10 minutes, and the rest is basically like a merry-go-round. He even makes a finger-twirling gesture in response to her raising the issue of pay gaps after he'd already refuted that argument earlier on. Saying that they're getting paid illegally less than men to do the same job. Well, That's not fair, well, is let's it? let's go to the first question. They're both those are complicated questions. The debate has become circular. Kathy does step up her game in places by switching to other attack modes, presumably written on her list. And she ups her non-verbal aggression at times with a bit of slight teeth bearing and raised voice, but not quite shouting. And Jordan's handling of this is interesting. He raises his voice too at times, but never raises it more than she does. Why should, Why should women, women be content not to get I'm not, not saying that they should the put up with it. I'm saying that the claim that the wage gap between men and women is only due to sex is wrong. And it is wrong. There's no doubt about that. The multivariate analysis have been done. So well, I, I can give you, you an example. You keep on talking wait, about wait multivariate analysis. Let me no, give no, you no, an example. I'm saying that 9% pay gap. Women are more agreeable than men. Again, a vast generalization. Some it's women not are not more agreeable than yes, men. Yes, that's true. But that's right. And some women get paid more than men. That's really important in man versus woman debates. Men are naturally more physically intimidating, so it's important to restrain themselves and limit their non-verbal aggression to that which is set by the woman. The guy can match the woman's aggression non-verbally, but not go above it, because if he goes above it, then he comes off as the bully. This actually gives women a lot of power in conversations with men. So just as she keeps pointing her pen at him, he starts pointing his finger at her, but usually without raising his hand from his knee, which is a less aggressive form. He reserves that for when she's being really unreasonable, counter-chastising her, so to speak. Do better, but the market sets the damn game. It's like... And the market is dominated by men. No, it's so not. It's you? not. The market is dominated by women. They make 80% of the consumer decisions. That's not the case what? at all. If you're talking 80%. about people who stay at home looking after children... In Scandinavia, it's 20 to so... 1 female nurses to male, something like that, it might not be quite that extreme, and approximately the same male engineers to female engineers. And that's a consequence of the free choice of men and women in the societies that have gone farther than any other societies to make gender e equality the purpose of the law. Those are ineradicable differences. You can eradicate them with tremendous social pressure and tyranny, but if you leave men and women to make their own choices, you will not get equal outcomes. Right, so you're saying that anyone who... Note that he also raises his eyebrows when pointing at her. Raised eyebrows is a non-aggressive gesture communicating the willingness to listen. So he's actually offsetting his own aggressive response in a way that lets her know that it's a display and not genuine hostility. He does a similar thing in the famous gotcha moment. With harder voice and frowning stare, he looks far more aggressive than at any other point in the interview. And he holds that stare for a second after he finishes speaking, but quickly smiles letting her off the hook, letting her know that he has the capacity to be nasty if she provokes him, and letting her know that he prefers to keep things friendly. And it works. She responds with smiles and laughter. Then he leans straight in and reaches out like he wants to touch her to give additional reassurance. Non-verbally, he is basically apologising for what he just did, and because he's just seen how uncomfortable he made her feel. So it's very hard to dislike a guy who is this considerate of an attacker's feelings, even if you totally disagree with his social and political views. It's totally clear that he is sensitive to her feelings, even though she's effectively trying to wreck his reputation. How can you dislike someone who shows that kind of humanity? And I'm talking from her position as well there. 
I think that's a great example of how people under attack in TV chat shows or general discussion can diffuse opponent aggression or at least ensure that their opponent is appropriately viewed as the bully. Actually, we could think of all this as like non-contact judo, using the attacker's own verbal aggression tactics against them. It ensures that the bully label goes to them, and it's like holding up a mirror to the opponent, which lets them know what it's like to be on the receiving end of their own hostility. So, a lot of excellent general communication strategies on display in this debate, verbally and non-verbally. Oh, last thing, about that picture of kids in a classroom, that seems to be there regarding the final few lines of attack, one of which is to accuse Jordan of being transphobic in the classroom setting. Interesting that this line of attack has been reserved for near the end of the interview and the picture placed in the background in waiting for that moment. The programme director must have assumed that it would be a pivotal moment where Jordan would crumble. It failed, of course. Right, there's plenty more I'd like to say about this interview, as this video has been almost exclusively about the non-verbal. If you'd like to see more on the subject, then hit the like and subscribe buttons there, and give the video a share for others who are interested in the Jordan Peterson Kathy Newman debate. I've got more videos and articles on psychology and other subjects at collativelearning.com, and I've got two other channels here on YouTube that you might want to take a look at. You've been listening to Rob Eger. Thanks for watching.